we're going to start out with Senator Gaddy's bill. So Senator Gaddy's bill is uh, 129 with regard to foster care children. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this issue, uh, it's a big problem, it's a big deal. It was brought to my attention uh, last summer at a, at a party. We were talking to some foster parents, and they let me know that even though a foster child may have been in foster care since they were an infant or a teenager, that once the clock strikes on their 18th birthday, they're, they're turned away. Uh, there's no more funding from them. And as, as you all know, many people turn 18 their senior year of high school. Uh, my daughter turned 18 this year uh, in January. And she had February, March, April, and May left to finish school. I cannot imagine if someone such as my daughter Catherine had, been, had to go find another school and, and do those things. But, but then it's deeper than that because a lot of the kids are in foster care. They have issues that they're dealing with. And they don't graduate on time, a lot of them. In fact, we've identified between 140 to 180 kids a year that age out of the system prior to graduation. And, and the secretary can correct me if those numbers are wrong. So let's talk about where those kids end up that age out. About 20% of them end up in prison or in some type of incarceration. About 25% end up homeless. And what that means is that we end up paying more for them where they end up than if we were just to do what this bill asks for and to extend what is considered uh, to be the best practice at this point for foster kids to extend their care to 21 or until they graduate from high school. So what this bill does is it looks at that gap problem and it, and it corrects it and my bill simply asks that the, the child remain uh, funded by the state until they graduate or attain the age of 21. Because by that point, we've found that they've learned a job skill, they've gone through goodwill training, they've had the time to get a GED, they've had a family to love on them, and you're going to hear some testimony today from some families and, and some children that I hope will help us understand uh, the severity of this issue. Uh, there is an amendment, though, just for procedural purposes. During the, during the hearing in health and welfare, it was brought to my attention by uh, a former district attorney and a, and a child advocate who is an attorney, uh, Mr. Ducote. Uh, he brought to our attention just some problems that, that we may want to address if we move in this direction. Line 6 uh, says the department shall continue to provide to a person in foster care and to the person's foster parents all benefits and services the department's foster care program after the person's 18th birthday if the person is a full-time high school student uh, and, and so on. That just clarifies what we want to do. But that last line that says, upon written consent of the person and the foster parents, because we have an anomaly that happens on the 18th birthday, even though this child can, needs care, they're no longer considered a child by our law. Uh, oh, that's right, yeah. So, so Mr. Chairman, and, and it was an epiphany to me, too. Uh, he was the last one to testify because, as you know, when you get assigned to represent a child or a parent in these uh, child in need of care cases, and ultimately if the child is deemed a ward of the state, uh, that's a juvenile court, and it's a juvenile ruling. So when they turn 18, they're no longer a juvenile, so that court no longer has jurisdiction, jurisdiction. nor does any order of that court. So th th this, this, this uh, paragraph A talks about the consent of both sides. Uh, paragraph B uh, says that the acceptance of the benefits and services shall in no way deprive the person formerly in foster care of any rights or obligations conferred by obtaining the age of majority. Uh, and that simply means a continuation of benefits, that if they were receiving A, B, and C from the department, the 18th birthday passes, they still receive A, B, and C until this new trigger or sunset date. Subsection C says the benefits and service prior under this section shall impose no obligation of reimbursement. Uh, there, uh, the attorney testified that there were some cases in other states maybe where reimbursement became an issue and we just didn't want the foster to parents in our state to, to, to hesitate at all uh, in, in signing up for this, for this uh, continued care. Uh, and that would, the, the, the subsection C takes care of that uh, 
issue that was brought up. Um, so, so and I, I guess an, an, an 18 year old, I guess even in not foster care could walk out the door at 18. Correct. Okay. And the same thing would be true of foster care. So to the extent that they would, the benefits would inure to, to that 18 year old, uh, but the parents wouldn't consent, obviously, if the child would, if the young adult had left the home. And that's great. And, and, and the picture that we're looking at, though, is not, I'm 18, I'm leaving. Mom, Dad, I'm tired of being here. The picture that is really tragic is they don't want to leave. Johnny's in January. He's finally made it to where he's going to graduate this year. He turns 18. And the parent, typically a foster parent who's called by God to be a foster parent, they don't have the financial ability to do it. Okay, so they highly rely on uh, the, the finances given by the state. And so when that child turns 18, the parent has to say, I love you, but I can't care for you anymore. And, and there's some folks that will testify about that. But so, so the age 18 is not some magic number. You know, uh, I'm 43, I still call my mom and dad. You know, I still ask my dad for stuff. They you still know? sending you money? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I, only if I cry, all right? <laughs> If I pinch my leg hard enough, sometimes it works. But, 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 but really, you know, the, these children become a part of the family of the foster family, and and, and it, it, it's tough to think that the, the, the small financial award from the state is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And and, and we're going to hear testimony about that. That it really is uh, the heart of these folks. And when you're caring for a special needs foster student or a student that struggled with PTSD or things like that, they don't graduate on time. A lot of them don't. So th that's just kind of with broad strokes uh, what the amendments do. And lastly, subpart D, um, it just further goes into consent. And every 90 days after until the child's 18th birthday, it just breaks it down a little bit more. So those are, I think that one is more technical than substantive. Well, like I said, I wasn't aware of it until you told us last week or the last couple of nights ago that this happens on a, not on a regular basis, just that's how it's structured, that they roll out and they're, and they're done. So, but even in regular, um, even under current statutes, uh, a divorced set of parents, they are obligated to take care of that child and provide child support until, they're eight, uh, until graduation from high school, currently, under current law. That's right. And so if you have a, and, and if you have a special needs child of that marriage that ultimately ends in a divorce, it's, long, it's, it's forever. It's part of child support that, yeah. that they must maintain that child. Uh, with health insurance or any benefits that they were accustomed to during the marriage. So so with non-foster parents, the obligation, uh, I say the state's obligation to substitute for the missing parents and by supporting the foster parents terminates at 18. But it that, doesn't terminate for anybody else. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And that's why I think a lot of us, when we, when we visit with foster kids and we talk about it, we think, well, they're going to get the care until the care is no longer needed. That's what I always like, assumed. Yeah. Like Title IX and child support for regular families, but th that is not true. And when I found this out, uh, you know, it, it's, it's devastating because it, this is not the nuclear family where the child walks out at 18 and says, I'm going to join the Marine Corps, I'm leaving. You know, this is, sorry, honey, I can't pay for you to be here anymore, and the state's not going to help you anymore. You don't have the skills to live, and they're finding these kids in laundromats that they're finding them in sex trafficking they're, because these are the weakest among us, you yeah. know? And so, uh, clearly people that are not choosing not to help themselves. They just don't have the resources to help themselves. Right. And they're finding through other States that have extended to 21 that we all know that something magical happens in the brain between 18 and 21, you know, and, 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 and in men sometimes later than women, you just start thinking differently about life and you're more open sometimes to advice and to care. And that's me being married to a psychologist. That's what she tells me. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but I think that's why it's 21, not 26 or 30. I think it's, right. you know, there's something magic about that time where children start to rely more on advice and not, I know what's best for me. And, uh, and this is, I mean, the foster, I mean, they're going from obviously unstable environment to a stable environment. That's correct. So they're already declared in need. And the, and the foster families have been vetted. And then, uh, you know, to turn them away just because a birthday happens, I think it's a, it's a tragedy. So. Just a side story. So I'm a prosecutor in New Orleans, right out of law school. My first, one of the first cases I got was a sex abuse case involving four siblings or five siblings. 
So uh, I won't go through the whole process about how they got discovered, but in the process of learning who they were and being able to have them feel comfortable about getting the testimony that I needed from them, because uh, they were four, six, uh, all the same age as the kids that I have in the back that are here today. Uh, I took them to McDonald's and we rode the streetcar and all this kind of stuff. And when I brought them back, and uh, when we left McDonald's, I noticed that they had not eaten all their food. And then I noticed that their backpacks, when I dropped them off, I had to tell non-foster parents, these were people from a local church that just basically found them. Their bags were filled with money, canned goods, all kinds of stuff. And I, I said, I don't, I, mean, I don't know what happened. They weren't interested in eating the food. And each of them said they do that all the time because they had been bounced around because the foster care, the system hadn't picked them up. The church had picked them up. Uh, and so they, they got moved around. And even at seven or eight, they had the wherewithal and instinctive, uh, they instinctively knew that they better prepare for the next move, which could be one week, three weeks. French fries, money, candy, all kinds of stuff in there. So anyway, uh, I'm glad you brought the bill uh, Well, that's, a, that's powerful, and we know that these children, when they turn 18, it's food, shelter. And, and, and that is why there's a, they're a high risk for sex trafficking. Yeah, because they're vulnerable and very yeah. vulnerable. They're vulnerable to ideas, and, and Senator Johns knows this from his extensive work in this area. I mean, they're vulnerable to these ideas. They're vulnerable to uh, negative peer pressure, and, and that's what we're going to. Uh, well, that's what I hope this bill fixes. I don't think every one of these foster children are going to consent to stay in the system. Right. Some of them may choose to leave. I guess. But I do think if we rebuild rebuild our system to where the children are seeing a, a benefit from being in foster care, which a lot of them do, uh, I think you will see more and more children saying, you know, I want to stay in this program towards graduation or learning a vocational skill between 18 and 21. And you're right, it's a lot more expensive if they end up going in the other direction. Uh, Senator Fannin, before you leave. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. L let me say uh, to you that it's emotional for y'all, but it's emotional for us, too. It really is. The, the part I'm struggling a, a little bit with, and uh, again, I commend you. Look, I want every child, I'm a, I'm a school teacher from many, many years ago, so I want every child to get an education. That's how you lift yourself up uh, in, in society. What I'm struggling with, you're here today as foster parents, but I have them come into my office, and single moms, that's not participating in the foster care, but they're almost like foster children out there. The mom is trying to raise a family and is struggling to keep them in school. And, and and they're struggling because they don't get any additional support like a foster parent does. Foster parents are really, I guess, awards of the state to some degree. I don't know how the laws uh, really do. I mean, but but our but our local officials try their best not to remove children from Pam uh, from parents. They they go out of the way not to do that but at the same time we have single moms that that just struggle and the point I'm trying to get to is that a lot of those things that we will be faced with financially in this session we we were not, we're not able to finance everything even though we we really want to those moms that come to my office, and you, and if you go to a, to a school, a high school, and you visit with parents and guide, I mean with principals and guidance counselors, they struggle with this continually. And, and parents, moms move their child from one school three times a year for, uh, to, to, to different schools. It's, it's, the, it's an issue. It's a societal issue. I don't have the answers to it. But I got to try to figure out how to be fair with all moms and uh, and, and, and to my, balance it. My yeah. response to that would be that these kids 
we're not asking for help for us for the right. moms. These kids are wards of the state and the response. Yeah, and and they are a ward. They have been. They, I understand, and there there is a difference. I mean, we, 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 there, there's a difference here in this building. But when I go back home in my office and have to deal with that. Uh, with with that parent, there's really not a lot of difference. Uh, to to be honest with you, deep down in your heart, uh, there's not. So. I, I look on this sheet and it talks about what we're going to fund. I, those that have medical condition that ran, I don't. There's no question. Uh, we 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 need to. And I think maybe they transition into other programs that the state offers too that might be helpful uh, in, in that case. Here's here's my issue, and and I don't know where it's an issue or not. One, I don't know where we still are wards of the state once they get to this age where we the state has a responsibility. But I have to share with you that I have a lot of students that are not foster students that are in families that fit the same situations when it comes to uh, being raised by a grandmother, being raised by a single parent that don't have help and guidance to, to get to the level that we're trying to get these. And, and, and I get that request in my office, uh, you know, and, and there's not much I can do for them. And I'm trying to separate these students from those students. And I, I'm just asking you: Are these stu will these students continue to be wards of the state, and uh, if 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 we allow this to happen, or these is this a new group of students that's just that we're going to try to guide and manage after they reach a certain age to do certain things? Look, what you're trying to do is keep them in school and train them and do those things. Uh, that's all commendable. That's what we need to be doing. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to separate. Uh, you know, I mean, we're we, we fixing to do something special for a group of students, and, and that's w all fine and well. I'm just thinking that we're not doing something for students that's almost fit that, except they were not foster uh, 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 students. They just happen to fit the same, basically the same type of predicaments that, <coughs> that, that we're talking about here, and I'm not sure we offer that for them. So. Senator Fan and I would say that the the biggest difference in in the constituent calls that you get and in these youth is that the children the people that call you they have a family these kids don't so they still they don't have a grandparent or a birth parent or an aunt or an uncle who are taking care of them what this program does is give us a little more time to work with them to fr try to find permanent connections or get them to a place where they are okay financially and emotionally and educationally to be able to stand on their own. I don't think that anybody at 21 or 18 or 17 is able to stand on their own. We're talking about kids who don't have a home. Um, not, not really a permanent home and trying to make sure that we're establishing that structure so that they can have some level of stability so that they can be productive members of society because guess what? If we don't help in, to try to invest in these young people now, we're going to end up paying for it later. Let, 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 let me, I, I wouldn't want these comments right, right now. It, it sounds like that we're not giving any foster parents any credit. Let me tell you, we got some excellent foster parents. Oh, in, I'm not saying that area. by any so stretch of the imagination. To, to say that they have no family, I well, mean, we got foster parents that's doing a super job uh, out, out I, here. Yeah. So I want them. I, I wasn't going to say anything else, but I didn't want it to <laughs> leave here. No, you right. That there, are some, parent, there are some foster families. Yeah. If it wasn't for them. These young people will be in, in such bad right. shape because they've been able to go back. They've been there. They've been in their support system. But then all of them have not. Okay. And so, you know, for some foster families, when they turn 18, then, then that was it. But then that, there are a lot of excellent foster families who have been there and have stayed the course. And guess what? They may be 40 years old just like our children, and they're still going back to that foster family for help and support. That's the big difference here, and that is really truly the difference because our children still come back to us. These children, you know, some of them did not have that. It wasn't their fault. They didn't ask for this, and they are making the best that they can out of the situation, and there are people who have stepped up to assist them, but in some cases there's nobody.